It is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce to you the superintendent of the Boston School District, Thomas W. Pizant. Tom is a Boston native. He received his high school diploma from Mount Hermon College, at Mount Hermon School, his bachelor's degree from Williams College, and holds a master's and doctorate in education from Harvard University. He began his career as a school district superintendent at the very tender age of 28, starting at a small district in Springfield, Pennsylvania, and from there, over the next 24 or five years, worked as superintendent in Oklahoma City, Eugene, Oregon, and finally in the San Diego Unified School District. There's a little two-year interlude where he served as an assistant uh, secretary for education in Washington, and then in October of 1995 came back to Boston and has been the superintendent of schools here in Boston ever since. As his time as superintendent winds down, although I don't believe winds down is quite the right word to use here, reaches a crescendo is perhaps a better way of expressing this. Um, he has developed a reputation as being a reform agent and an innovator who began his career in 1996 with a reform plan known as Focus on Children the key elements of which were to produce a common expectation for all students, a curriculum that gave students access to rigorous content, expectations about instructional practice and support of teachers, and assessments that provided information to guide instruction and hold schools accountable for the results. A recent study of his time as the superintendent in the Boston Public Schools notes higher student achievement, stronger instructional capacity, an improved district culture and climate, and an infrastructure that supports effective teaching. Boston has in fact become famous across this nation as a place for success and stability in an urban setting, which we wish we could say was true for the rest of the country. It is certainly true for Boston. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce for his presentation, Thomas W. Pizant. Thank you very much, Tom, and good evening. I had some choices to make, which is always true when you are provided with a wonderful opportunity, such as has been provided by the Ford Hall Forum to take 30 minutes or so to talk about something that you care a lot about. My choices really came down to two things that I thought I might do. One would be to talk about the last 10 years and where we are and where my successor is still got plenty of room to do some important things, or to really frame the conversation in a much broader way to suggest that the issues that we all ought to be interested in at the local level are really issues that have tremendous importance, certainly for us as a nation, and particularly for us as a nation in a world that is changing very, very much. So I entitled my talk this evening, Public Education and the Common Good, where do we stand and in what direction are we moving? And the last part of the phrase I have to attribute to Oliver Wendell Holmes, who, and I paraphrase, said something like this, the important thing is not where we stand, but in what direction we are moving. I have to start with a couple of questions to learn a little bit about you. How many of you went to public elementary and or secondary schools? Most. Almost all. How many of you have had or do now have children in public elementary or secondary schools? 
interesting, about half as many. How about grandchildren, nieces or nephews, or kids on your block? I say that because my fundamental premise is that public education, democracy, and the common good are intertwined. Just a few brief snippets about public education. It really all started here, like so many things, and it's very appropriate to start this talk in this building and remind you that the first public school in America began in 1635 here in Boston, and it was the Boston Latin School. And it wasn't that place across the river called Harvard. It was not founded until a year later in 1636. Now, by today's definition, it would be difficult to say that the first public school was public in the same sense that we embrace public now because not everybody got to go who wanted to go. The clergy were very much present in that first public school and then the college to become a university across the river. That was the 17th century long, long time ago. Today, Boston Latin is one of three exam schools, one of 145 Boston public schools. It's one of the best public high schools in America, and it probably exceeds any other public school in America with respect to the number of graduates that are admitted to Harvard each year. The class of 2006, 30 Boston Latin graduates were admitted to Harvard, and 11 are on the wait list. And it's been anywhere from 25 to 27 or 28 a year for a long time. So from some 370 years to now, that school that started as a public school defined by 17th century standards is still around today and a Boston public school. That was the 17th century. What would we say about the 18th century? Some 130 years later, in 1758 to be exact, John Adams wrote, and I quote, the whole people must take upon themselves the education of the whole people and be willing to bear the expense of it. That was 1758, also here. He probably could not imagine that almost 250 years later that there are still disagreements about who should bear the responsibility for the education of all children and pay the bills for it. And of course, how much is too much to spend on public schools, recognizing that the cost of educating children, those costs will vary depending upon children's needs. And that debate is alive and well today. A 19th century snippet, 1837 after a career in law and politics, which included president of the Senate here in the Commonwealth. Horace Mann began what would be a 12-year stint as the head of the first Board of Education, State Board of Education. And he, he it was the Massachusetts Board of Education first in the country, and he is often referenced as the person who first spoke about education and the common good, and as being the reference point for public
public education in America. Now, John Adams might not have agreed with that, but we can read history in a variety of ways. He made the case for the common school, believing that an educated citizenry was essential to sustain democracy and provide for the common good. And that's why he developed the reputation of being the father of public education, who believed that it was the mainstay of democracy. What about the 20th century? During the early decades, the common good was often associated with the mission of government and the influence of the progressives and good government. It was an idea that really was focused on what was an expanding working but a rising middle class in America. And public education was beginning to serve that rising working class and waves of immigrants who came to this country with the public schools being the place where they were educated, socialized, and ultimately naturalized as citizens. But as we move through the 20th century, things changed rather dramatically. And there was a real shift post-World War II. And what the GI Bill of Rights did was open opportunity for many veterans returning from the war to go on to college, which had not been an aspiration for most of the population prior to World War II, in large part because of the Depression and the lack of resources to pay for a college education rather than go to work and make money to support oneself or one's family. But even then, in post-World War II times, there were still people with an eighth grade education who could get a decent job. That disappeared rather quickly, but people with a high school diploma still could. I grew up in Quincy. I remember Four River Shipyard in the 40s and the 50s. You could go to Four River Shipyard with an eighth grade education, be trained in a trade, make a living wage that would enable you to buy a little bungalow in Quincy and if it was a two-parent family and there were kids, a spouse could stay home. Those days are gone. 21st century and public education. Lots of change. It was only last year, well, a year and a half ago, that we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education. I was in ninth grade in 1954, and I don't remember having any awareness that that court case was decided. But little did I know what an impact it would have on me personally and professionally in terms of the last 50 years. It was an important case, not because it accomplished all it set out to do, but it did begin to redefine the debate about public education and the common good and who had access to the common good and who didn't, double standards and then when the Civil Rights Movement came along in the early 60s, that was a powerful, powerful effort with voters' rights and other things besides education that moved the debate forward. But here we are in the 21st century still struggling, struggling with many of those issues which I want to comment on 
tonight which do connect to this notion of public education in a democracy and the common good. And remember, it was two public institutions that stepped up, perhaps forced by the courts in one instance, but not in the first. And it was the United States military, President Harry Truman, who took the first steps to integrate the services. And then the public education piece came later that was driven through most of the last 50 years by the courts, not by the political will of those that we elect to make policy in this democracy. Of course, we still are sober despite the progress made by the civil rights movement, that we still have a long way to go to reach agreement on and establish practices which strike the right balance between individual rights and the common good. And we no longer have the luxury of thinking about this challenge block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, community by community, state by state, or in the 50 United States, for in this century, we in America are inextricably connected to the rest of the world, where there are many different views about our American notion of the common good and democracy. Today, we in America are still struggling to define the line between the private and public interests and the role government should play to serve each. The lines are even more blurred in many parts of the world, and Americans are not as welcome abroad as we once were. It is easier to export our innovations than our ideas about democracy and our ideals about the common good. Our students' achievement in elementary and secondary schools does not compare well with too many other countries. However, our colleges and universities attract people from all over the world. And many, some would say most of our colleges and universities are world class and compete or exceed the excellent standards that we uh, find anywhere abroad. But remember that there are very few countries in the world that are committed to provide universal free public education for all students. And that still is in America the goal. And I will come back to that in a moment. The talk I gave 10 years ago, it wasn't the Ford Hall Forum talk, but another one. I made the argument that education and democracy are intertwined. If one falters, the other will be in peril. If only some citizens care about public education, all citizens will be at risk. The reason I did the little quiz at the beginning, if you've had direct experience with public education, some of it may have been positive, some of it may not have been, but you had the experience with it, and at least you know what it is and have some sense of what it did or did not do for you. But my argument is, even if you didn't, because public education is about the strength of democracy and the common good, as John Adams said, everybody has a responsibility for supporting it. I'm worried about some warning signs, and there are four I'm going to talk about briefly. First is, what is happening with respect to our perceptions about government, if not the reality of what government has become with respect to what it thinks its mission is and what it does. Government has been a cornerstone of democracy, but it has lost the respect of many. President Bush's 
numbers are at a low point, as low as just about any president has been in some time. The question is, is there a distinction? If the question is the presidency at a low point, it's a little different kind of question. But you look at the poll data on Congress, only two points behind Bush in terms of the low point. And yet the polls consistently have said for some time now that people are basically satisfied with their congressperson, but the institution is flawed. And I guess the polls are right, because if you look at what incumbency does in giving you a leg up on getting reelected, the data are pretty powerful. And perhaps a bigger worry is that the judiciary may not be far behind. Don't know whether you followed an in, interesting case that's before the, the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts. And the case is whether or not those who want to do a ballot initiative on gay marriage, that if it led to the voters saying, Gay marriage should not any longer exist in Massachusetts. Can the results of a ballot initiative trump a Supreme Judicial Court decision that interprets the Constitution? And that is a very, very heavy issue when you think about the three parts of government in our democracy the checks and balances, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. And we can have a whole conversation about what's going on in terms of the debate about executive power right now, but that's another speech. I can give broader speeches like that when I get out of this job. <laughs> so I am worried about government, because government is so essential to democracy, and it really exists to serve the people, to serve the citizenry. The other factor that disturbs me greatly is what's happening in terms of the declining percentage of eligible voters who do go to the polls and vote, and particularly young people. There was a little upsurge in, in this last presidential election, but basically it's people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s that still, with diligence, never miss an opportunity to vote. I was not 21 in 1960 in time to vote in the presidential election. So the first time I voted was, interestingly enough, in the Democratic primary here in Massachusetts when Eddie McCormick, Jr. ran against Ted Kennedy. And I couldn't wait to vote the first time. And I don't think I've missed voting any time in my life in eight different states that I've been in over the last 45 years. But something is wrong there when the hallmark of democracy is not valued and acted on because if people don't vote, the democracy will not be what it could be. Uh, second, if I look back at my career, I'm really worried about special interest politics and single issue politics. Another story, um, there are people in the room that can remember this well. I asked some kids today, elementary kids that are at a school, if they had ever seen black and white television. <laughs> and I, I told them a, a little story, a different one from what I'm going to tell you, but I remember in 1952, in the summer, my maternal grandparents who lived in Maryland finally broke down and bought a TV. We, my mother couldn't afford one, and there was only one in our neighborhood where all the kids went on <clears throat> Friday night to, to, to watch a couple of the sitcoms. We didn't call them that then. And I was fascinated because it was the first time the national 
conventions in the summer were televised. And remember, it was Ike and Bob Taft. My point is that most of what happened in the convention was all around the party platform. And so the issue was who was going to be voting for the party platform and getting the right party platform because the assumption was whoever the presidential nominee was, that his responsibility was to go out and get elected on the party platform, which addressed all of the key issues. So the differences were in the platforms. And now, years, years later, over time what's happened is you've got to nod to every special interest. And it's affected my life tremendously. I can't tell you how many school board meetings over the last 35 to 40 years I've sat in and heard special interest group after special interest group come to the microphone and say, you better do this for us, da 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 And I worry about that. That isn't to say that there doesn't have to be advocacy for particular issues or particular interests, but at some point the whole picture has got to be shaped and it's got to be more than the sum of its parts. So I worry about the warning sign about what special interests are doing to this democracy. Third, I worry about the erosion of civility. In our daily lives, in the discourse, in the standards that we hold up for what is okay acceptable in the public space. And I went to the dictionary and I looked up a few C words and I wanted to see what the dictionary, what Webster had said about civility and I was rather surprised. It wasn't surprised when he talked about or wrote about courtesy and politeness, which are fundamental in terms of civility, but talked about one of the definitions was training in the humanities. I hadn't thought about that. Civility, training in the humanities. And then I thought about my own liberal arts education at Williams College and how fundamental that has been to everything that I have continued to learn and do over the years. And how there's so much pressure to move the liberal arts out in this age of science in mathematics, not that that's not important. But what do we need to do in terms of public education and the common good to get back to this issue of civility and respect and discourse? Fourth and finally, I'm worried about the wonderful opportunity that increasing diversity in this country provides. I'm talking about diversity of race, class, culture, and how we are dealing or not dealing with it. There's no better place to talk about that than in Boston, Massachusetts. I was away for 30 years. When I left in the middle 60s, um, Boston was still pretty much a place where the white population was predominantly WASP, Irish, or Italian. And the major population of color African-American, and African-Americans who had been here for a generation or had moved south with lots of African-Americans from the south and moved to the northern cities in the 40s and 50s and after. I followed Boston from afar. I've been here a few times. I haven't had any relatives here since 1974. But it's a very different place today very different place. The black population is very diverse. 
It's West Indies. It's Haitian. It's Cape Verdean. It's Somali. It's Nigerian. What was a small Puerto Rican population, Hispanic, grew larger. Over 30% of our students are Hispanic now. But Dominican Republic, every country in Central America, countries in South America. I remember Chinatown in the 40s and 50s. But then Vietnamese, Cambodian, most Cambodians that moved north or south of Boston, but there's still a large Vietnamese population. And interestingly enough, Hong Kong Chinese, Taiwanese, and newly arriving Chinese from mainland China. Very different mix, and a little bit from every other part of the world. We stopped counting the number of languages. And what's going on in America right now is one of many periods in our history where we've had the debate about immigrants. How many of you in this audience had parents who came here from another country? Okay. Not as many as I might have thought. Uh, my grandfather came here from Nova Scotia in about 1912. He was a carpenter. He had three children. My father was one. And they moved to Wollaston. And my grandfather was a carpenter that built three deckers in Wollaston and Quincy. And we're having this argument about what we should do with immigrants. And According to the news I heard just briefly today, the Senate's come to some kind of an agreement, I gather, on a bill that would provide some opportunity for those immigrants who are here to have a way to apply for citizenship. I really do think we have to come to grips with the issue of diversity, around equity issues, around access issues, around support issues. And if we don't get it right this time, I worry about the democracy and the common good. What I'm very bullish about is that the Boston Public Schools are a very, very different place and on this issue, and I would invite any of you anytime to go in and see the beautiful children in the Boston Public Schools and how the future bodes well for them if we can give them the kind of support and the help that they need. I need to wrap up now. We can talk all about the Boston Public Schools in the Q&A if you want, but I wanted you to think about these larger issues. And I just want to read a couple of things that I wrote last night to kind of sum up where I am. One making reference to a piece that I wrote about 10 years ago for um, one of the schools that um, in an alumni magazine. It was actually 13 years ago. I was, I said this in the article, and I quote, our American destiny is with what unifies and unites us, not with what separates and divides us. No doubt exists about the powerful forces that in certain combinations can lead to separatism. All the more reason to take seriously the opportunity that diversity offers to bring us together with new appreciation, understanding, and respect for our differences. As individuals, we must move away from the traditions of exclusion to new practices of inclusion. Individuals must model the same behavior for groups. Adults must do it for children. The price of inclusion need not be the sacrifice of individual identity for the common characteristics of the group. There must be room for both in our schools, communities, and nation. 
we must balance the rights of the individual with those of the group and the common good. That was from 13 years ago. This is from last night. I want to turn now um, to a, a, a little summary piece here from last night. To get back to public education and the common good and where we stand and what direction we are moving. I think we must stand where John Dewey did more than 100 years ago when he said, and I quote, what the best and wisest parent wants for his own child, that must the community want for all of its children. Any other ideal for our schools is narrow and unlovely. Acted upon, it destroys our democracy. My children might say different things about what I'm about to say, but our three who are now in their late 30s and early 40s, and we have five grandchildren. All three of our children went through 13 years of schools where I was superintendent, school districts. Two in three different districts and one in four. And I really believed, and my wife Ellen did, that if I was going to lead a school system, that could stand up and say, I want for your child what I want for my own, that our children were going to be in the public schools. Not that we, if I was in another profession, probably wouldn't have done that anyway. But that's very, very important. And I wish there were more educators that did that. Because when we who are working with children during the day say we are willing to have our colleagues work with ours as well as yours, it is a powerful statement. And we need to get to that place. Standards-based education is really a radical idea. It's standards that are clear with respect to what students should learn, is providing a curriculum that will give them access to good content that teachers can teach them. It requires support for teachers and principals who are doing the work, training and development so they can get better at what they do. It requires assessments that will give us a sense of what kind of progress students are making, what's working, what's not, and it requires a real sincere effort to engage families and community as partners. And it's a package. It's not five silos. We'll work on the expectations for learning here. We'll do the professional development over here. And we'll do the assessments over here. They've got to be coherent and aligned in a package. But it's a radical idea because what I said earlier, we have said in this country is that we've got to get every student to a much higher standard than we ever did before because there are no safety nets for those who don't. And the reality is today that the goal has to be students graduating with a high school diploma that will provide them with access and ready to go on to some kind of post-secondary education. It might be a technical school, a community college, a four-year college, a university. But that really is what it's going to take in terms of accessing opportunity. So it's not just access to education for all, but it's results that prepare all students for a good life, responsible citizenship, and a successful career. And I keep coming back to them again. We must will it be willing to bear the expense of it because the connection to the democracy and the common good is the education of this generation that will enable them to be prepared to do their part as citizens in democracy and as taxpayers who will support public education and other things that government need to provide to address the common good. That's why it's so important. 
Yes, I'm worried about special interests, but they will exist. But they must not survive by eroding our commitment to protect the common good. And by the way, I don't see individual rights as synonymous with special interests. There's a distinction there. Special interests are quite capable of trumping individual rights. The common good at times will be in conflict with individual rights. The challenge is to understand the necessity of attending to the balance between the two. It can only happen in a democracy that honors and respects the checks and balances, which by design are embedded in the three branches of our government. In a democracy that is serious about the responsibilities of citizens who have the right and obligation to vote. In a democracy that encourages debate in public spaces, which produce climates of civility and respect, in a democracy that embraces diversity, in a democracy that supports adults being the first teachers of their children and modeling for them the behavior that will continue to make the next generation understand their obligation to be citizens. And a democracy that is committed to deal with the issues of equity that are raised around the conversation, which is a different, difficult conversation to have about race and class and culture. As I said earlier, the public space for democracy was once the public square. And I want to say this last bit with, I think, a little bit of hope and optimism and a little bit of concern. Now there are new spaces that leave no room for patience and deferred gratification. The internet, podcasts, blogs, text messaging, and cell phones. Democracy requires real-time, real-time commitment, as does discourse and action to create and sustain the common good. The purpose of education is to learn what to do when we don't know, but the students we teach in the public schools of America must learn that virtual reality is not the most important place. Solitude can be a beautiful space for learning, but absent discourse in public places with citizens of the community, it will be insufficient. We say we believe in public education for all students, that in a democracy, government should serve the common good. It is not enough to be comfortable with what we believe and say. We all have to stand up, move in the right direction, and do. I end with T.S. Eliot, and I quote, it is in fact a part of the functions of education to help us escape, not from our own time, for we are bound by that, but from the intellectual and emotional limitations of our own times. I do believe the glass is half full, but we have more to do to fill the glass, and that is the goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pizant. It is now the time for us to be interactive and uh, to uh, ask whatever question you may have. There, there is only one real requirement, and that is that whatever question you act is ask is, is recognizably a question. And you know what I mean, I believe. So I will exercise the moderator's prerogative in this and actually ask the first one. After that, it really is up to you. The microphone is right here in the middle of the hall. So 
anybody interested in standing in line behind that microphone is invited to do so in just a moment. The, the question I have for the superintendent is a what if question. What if you could put in this room right now the presidents of all of the colleges and universities that have a footprint in Boston? And that includes some you may not think of, like Tufts, for example, with a medical school and Harvard with a business school. If you could put all those presidents in this room and tell them you have some things that you would like to see them do, them, their faculty, their students, that they're not doing today or not doing well enough today to help the quality of the educational experience or raise up the quality of the experience for the Boston public school children and thereby contribute to the public good, what would your list be? Let me say first a word about context. When I first started as superintendent in 1995, I found that there were lots of things going on in the Boston Public Schools, lots of projects. And the wonderful thing about Boston is that there are so many higher education institutions, private nonprofits, community-based organizations, talented, interested people, and they've all got an idea. And very often, they believe that their idea could be perfectly tried in one of our schools. And they'll even bring some human resources along to work on it and maybe a couple thousand dollars. And what I found was there were a lot of these little ideas and little projects all over the city. And I started asking the question, well, to what extent are they making a difference in terms of improving teaching and learning for all students? And usually, answers, well, these are enrichment activities. And I said, well, enrichment activities are fine, but I'm worried about children learning to read and to be able to think and to solve problems and to write a decent essay. And I know enrichment activities will help them perhaps see some things and think about some things, but will the, it help their their reading skills, their writing skills, their thinking skills. So I really push back a lot in terms of working with the funders and with the higher education partnership is that we had to align resources, human and dollar resources around the, the major goals of the school system. And so I would start by reinforcing that message and it's doing a few things and to the extent that some of the higher education institutions would work together on the same thing which is, as, as Tom knows, and he's been terrific in this, is trying to get people in arts and sciences who are uh, mathematicians and scientists to work with colleagues in the School or College of Education. And Northeastern is doing some really interesting work on that front, as are several of the other universities. So that's where I would start. Let me give you two or three examples, and this is off the top of the head. We're doing a lot with high school reform. We're breaking up big comprehensive high schools into smaller schools and small learning communities. And the idea is not that small is beautiful, but if you take what small allows you to do that big won't in terms of developing relationships, paying attention to each other, having a group of teachers work with students over time, get to know them, that you can create a climate for learning where the relationships are stronger and the focus on the quality of instruction and the curriculum all those three come together. One of the notions is something called an early college high school. And it's not a brand new idea. It first started maybe 25 years ago at LaGuardia Community College in New York City. And the idea was to take students who weren't being very successful in the mainstream high school that could be everything from gifted kids who were bored to dropouts and everything in between. and put them on a college campus in a program that would allow them to complete their high school course requirements but begin to be exposed to some more rigorous college level courses. 
and there's a lot of interest in terms of from the from the um, high school folks about trying to get some of that started in Boston. In fact, Gates Foundation, who has given us a lot of support for our small school initiative, has a separate initiative around early college high schools. As with many things, good ideas like that run smack up against we don't have space. Um, I was not successful in getting one started in San Diego, where there was space, but the community college faculty just didn't want those kids on our campus. There's enough data now around from a few of these around the country that have been in business for six, eight, 10, dozen, 15 years that they can be very, very successful. So one of the things I would do, let's think about some early college high schools, but they really need to be located on or right adjacent to the college or university campus. Um, secondly, I would say, uh, particularly to the the universities that have multiple schools, arts and sciences, undergraduate and graduate programs, public health, law, business schools, um, education, schools of education, that it would be really interesting to have a college or university take one or two schools and take the expertise around not just the teaching and learning piece, which usually falls to the School of Education or those with teacher training institutions, but the other schools that have expertise that could help create a series of supports for children and families that deal with public health, social services, housing, jobs, full service schools, where the expertise from the higher education community would come not just from the teacher training component. And to put people and some dollar resources into that effort, so going deep and owning a single school or two rather than projects in many. And the third and final thing is one of our big challenges, if I had been doing a different kind of talk tonight about education, we've got major turnover that has started in terms of retiring teachers. And we have shortages of teachers to come into jobs in mathematics and science and special education and English as a second language with urban districts, particularly in America, with large numbers of English language learners. And so <clears throat> I, I can't be as specific about this one, but it's working on the human capital issue and, and looking at how we get good people into teaching provide them the support in their first several years, which we don't do very well, getting them hooked on a career and providing career ladders that enable them to stay as teachers rather than becoming administrators. And um, to, to think about that systemically, not just a little piece here and a little piece there, and whether the universities all trying to do this train to, to provide training for the same kind of teachers, and some don't, some just do secondary, some just do elementary, some even are narrower than that. But to think about that whole issue together with a cross institutional group through the higher education partnership, um, because we're we're trying to do real strategic thinking about where to go. There is now a new group of people who want to teach, but unlike most in previous decades, who came into teaching think they, thinking they were going to make it a career, there is now an increasingly growing group that want to try it. 
And they come from the pers two perspectives. And we get this from exit interviews and so on. One is teaching in an urban school district for many, which is the good news now, is like those who wanted to be in the Peace Corps back in the early 60s. They really do come with, with great motivation and real interest in caring and want to try it. But not everybody stayed in the Peace Corps and made it a career. Most didn't. They came out and went to graduate school and ended up as doctors and lawyers and business people and in other professions. So part of the reality is recognizing what do you do with that group of talent and how do you maximize that as part of the solution. But then at the same time, how do you build a cadre of career folks? And does that mean that we have to rethink the way in which we train teachers and in what setting? We're doing our own program now, and it kind of flustered the teacher training institutions initially because it was some competition. But even when we get to our goal in another couple of years of maybe 100, 120 teachers a year, that's going to be about 25 to 30 percent of our annual need. So there's going to be plenty of room for others to be in the business and doing part of this. So this is a long answer, but you gave me a big <laughs> question. And um, so those would be three, three things that I would say. And if I had time to think them through, I'd be a lot crisper. Let's try to be crisper for the other questions. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of us agree that having um, strong public schools with a lot of people invested in them and our communities invested in them is a, is a good thing. Um, however, kind of as you indicated in the beginning, when you do talk to parents, many parents say, uh, ideally in an ideal world, Yes, I, I would send my child, and all children would go to public schools. But uh, I'm looking out for, 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 for what's best for my children. My public school is okay. There's a great private school down the street, um, and, and that seems to be something of a trend. What What would you say to a parent who who is telling you, I, "Yes, it, it's great if if we all send our children to to public schools, but." I, I, I want to send that well, I want to be very clear. I, I would not take any stage because I do not believe that independent schools should go away, that religious schools are taboo. My line in the sand is that they should not be funded with public dollars, but they ought to be there as options. And I'm not uh, afraid of choice within the public school system. I think choice is is one of the answers to your question. And we have a lot more choices in Boston public schools that most are aware exist. And we haven't done as good a job as we need to in this world of marketing and branding, of doing just that. Schools are very different today than they were 10 years ago. And one of our strategies is to get a group of parents who have preschool children and rather than say, well, if you'd like to go to visit a school by yourself, go do it, getting groups of parents of, you know, maybe three, three or four parents together or three or four couples and kind of facilitate a visit to a, a series of schools over time so that they can see firsthand what's going on. There is no way I can capture in, in a video, um, on an audio tape, in a speech, or just in an informal conversation, what you can glean from being there firsthand, seeing the children, seeing the teachers, seeing what's going on. Principal for a day, which we do every year, we get about 100, 125 community leaders, business leaders that go into a school for a day. And then the last couple of years, Chad Gifford at Bank of America has hosted a, an early afternoon lunch when everybody gathers and comes back. And a lot of these people have not been in a public school, certainly not in Boston, for years, if ever. And they come back shaking their heads. The kids are fabulous. There's real order in the schools. The teachers are teaching. I wouldn't want to be a principal, but 
there are fantastic things going on. And it's like, ta-ha. So our biggest challenge is not saying that it's right for everybody, but getting people in to look. Go back to our kids. When I was superintendent in Oklahoma City, we lived in a, uh, an old neighborhood near downtown that had started to have some big old houses come back and gentrify a bit. And there was a, a busing deseg program in Oklahoma City, and our youngest was in fourth grade at the time. She went to a neighborhood school where black kids were bused in. And then our daughter, who was in middle school, had to be bused across town to a, a middle school in a black community, and that was a predominantly black school. And our son was in the middle of ninth grade and went to a high school that was 70% black and probably 60% free and reduced price lunch. Nobody else in our neighborhood sent the kids to those schools. And what kind of experience did our kids have? They had some mediocre teachers. They had some outstanding teachers. And they did fine. You know, our son went on, he went to Williams, graduated there. He wanted to play basketball. Inner city school, he made the team as the as the twelfth man his sophomore year. There were two white kids on the team. He didn't play much. They won the state championship that year. The last two years, he started a point guard. He got a national scholarship. He got into Williams. Um, he didn't. He took a couple of AP courses that didn't really have terrific teachers. But he had family and parent support too. And the same thing happened with the girls. Those kids, the two girls graduated in San Diego. Similar kind. Not. It was a. They were 50-50 they were schools, basically, 50% white, 50% black and Latino. But uh, they, they're they comfortable in any setting. They can go any place. And that part of the education cannot be achieved in a homogeneous neighborhood where everybody in the school looks like everybody else. And that's where I come back to the diversity issue. And I think there are a group of parents that have chosen to live in the city rather than outside because they want that. What they want to be convinced is that the quality of what their children get in the schools will enable them to go on to college and so on. The stories of our kids that are doing amazing things regardless of, of their circumstances are just, just remarkable. But the only way for people to... to to make that decision, and I don't, I'm not trying to be judgmental, it may be right for one or two of their kids and not buy it for a third, but go in and see. Don't look at one or two schools. Don't look at the school that somebody said, well, that's the only good one in the city. Uh, there are many now, and that's the only way we can bring people in. And I hope we continue to